Right, cool. Hello, everyone. Welcome to your course, AI for Art, Aesthetics, and Creativity. Today, we have a very special speaker. Uh, she has a excellent background in different domains, and uh, she will tell you hopefully more about herself and her work. Um, Sarah is a great friend and great uh, colleague of me, and she kindly accepted to give us a lecture talk today. So um, from here, I let, the, uh, I let Sarah to continue. Please go ahead. Thanks, Ali. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've heard so much about this class. Um, I don't think I have a slide about my background, but I can tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I finished my PhD in neuroscience, so across the street from CSAIL last year, um, and now I'm a postdoc in the vision group. And the journey throughout my PhD was a little bit of a winding path. Um, I started thinking about explicit symbolic models for things like physics, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, along the way. So modeling how the mind makes inferences about things that we see. But that hits a ceiling when we come up against questions of vision and types of seeing, like looking at art, that is really difficult to develop some kind of computational formalism for that we don't have good models for. And at the same time as I was kind of hitting that wall in my own thinking, I was developing a parallel interest um, in visual art and doing a lot of different projects, both with individual artists and with larger museum archives that I'll talk a little bit about, um, and started to look at art as a ground for asking kind of difficult questions on the frontier of our thinking about the mind. If we look at how humans create art and, and view art, can we understand something about how they view the world in domains that we don't yet have good models of cognition for? Um, so I kind of started steering my, my PhD in that direction. Uh, I'll share a little bit of that work as well. Um, and as I said, now I'm a postdoc with, with Antonio. And Ali asked me to share a little bit of my my inspiration behind that path. Uh, I don't have a, a good story about a specific moment. I think it's been a lifelong interest for me uh, since I was super small and reading a lot of poetry, I guess, um, thinking about kind of the, the origin and nature of structure in our experience of the world. I know that's quite an abstract thing, um, but the structure that we see in, in visual patterns, uh, where does that come from? Is that something that lives inherently in the brain and we imprint it onto kind of noisy and unordered stimuli, or is it something that's external, you know, a nature nurture question. Uh, and then our brains kind of evolved to reflect. And I got interested in this meeting point, this kind of layer between the self and the world where all the action happens, so to speak. Uh, and had training in, in applied math before I came to MIT. Um, and we think about ways to describe kind of structured inputs to processing systems and understand something about the structure of external inputs. And then uh, in my neuroscience background, learned a little bit how to, how to think about and model the structure of a processing system, right? the structure of different parts of the brain. Uh, and it's really been through my interest in visual art that we can start to think about and describe what happens when those two things meet and how we synthesize our world of, of visual experience um, in domains related to art and then other kind of higher level aspects of cognition like scenes or associations um, with moods of scenes and that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's where I am now. And I think I'd, I'd like to start us off unless anybody has any leading questions about where I come from um, with kind of a provocation. And you can, you can think of this as a frame for what I'll share today, but it's intended to be provocative. And so the statement I'll make is that visual perception itself, human perception, which we attempt to mirror and model uh, in computer vision and computer science in some cases, that human perception is something that's fundamentally constructive. And I say that because it solves an ill-posed inverse problem, like ones you've probably heard of before. And doing that, doing that solving requires a little bit of creativity. So where am I coming from there? The back of your eye, as you know, is, is a 2D flat canvas, right? Made up of a hierarchy of cells that were visualized in, in drawing and art by Ramon y Cajal hundreds of years ago and are now visualized using electromagnetic imaging. We can get actually pretty fine grained detail of the cells in the back of our eye that constitute a 2D canvas that takes in 
incoming image data and represents images in terms of patterns of activations via this kind of mosaic of cells. Yet, we experience this richly 3D world. So this is a setup of a problem that you've probably heard before, right? 2D canvas, but we have 3D rich experience. Scenes have depth, objects have 3D shape. And furthermore, what we see carries lots of different meanings and associations. So where is all of that kind of higher level information in a 2D image? Classical kind of computer vision problems. If you look at this kind of painting by Suzanne, you might not only recognize 3D structure of this cottage on the mountainside, right? Even though the image itself is 2D, I might have all sorts of associations with it. I might be able to say, oh, it's springtime, think something about the time of year. I might even be able to infer something about the geography by the palette used to convey what fields might be there. Think a little bit about the landscape. I might be able to appreciate depth in pictorial space, so even on this 2D plane. If I put my mouse up here in the front, maybe these fields are, are closer to me as a viewer than, than these ones that are far away. But once again, I'm just looking at a flat picture. Where is all of that information? Our brain has to solve an inverse problem like this. Anytime we look at a visual scene, it has to get from low two-dimensional information to kind of rich 3D. But there's a fundamental problem here that I pointed to. That is that infinitely many 3D objects can cause the same 2D project projection. That's the under constrained nature of this inverse problem that vision poses. And you've experienced this quite explicitly anytime you've seen a shadow and not the object causing the shadow, right? And you've had to infer, oh, is that actually you know, a monster on the wall or is that somebody's hand being projected? But there are infinitely many configurations in three dimensions that could be projected downwards onto two dimensions and cause some configuration in pictorial space. So how do we constrain that problem when we're solving for what we see, right? So this problem is ill-posed because it has, as I said, many, infinitely many possible solutions and choosing between them requires some additional information. And in the case of the brain, modern neuroscience understands this as requiring the brain to construct something. So that's what I mean when I say perception is fundamentally constructive or creative. It requires the brain to construct a best explanation of what it's seeing, of incoming information. And if we call that perception, then maybe you'll permit me to make a bit of a stretch and say that that makes perception itself an act of creation or an act of synthesis of a scene. So one kind of popular way to solve this inference problem is by using models of the world Right? And we can approach that from a Bayesian lens. Maybe you've seen the work of Josh Tenenbaum in the BCS department. Um, or maybe we can do that purely with deep learning. It's kind of a tension that we could explore later today. Um, but I'll give you an example here. And this is, let me back up for a second. If we were in person, this is the point where I would do kind of a live in-person demo. So I want you to imagine that we're all sitting kind of in a dark room or we're sitting in a studio space. And out in front of you, there is a table covered in black velvet, and I've set some stuff on that table. You don't know what it is. I set it there when the lights were off. And then I take a single line of red laser light, and I'm going to gradually sweep it over the scene. So I'm constraining the visual information you're going to receive about what's out there in the world um, to something kind of really low dimensional compared to what you normally get to understand kind of a garden of forms that would be sitting on the table. So imagine you're there in the studio with me and you see the following. You have to kind of infer what you see on the table. Maybe you could write it in the chat or just think to yourself when you see this, give it a moment. What's sitting here on the table? Or what kinds of things? What different things? Maybe this would be a good use of the chat. I can pull it up. Or you can describe features of, of what you see. Bunch of blocks on the table. Great. There's something cubic. Oh, now I see the corner there, right? Multiple vases, multiple forms with kind of different underlying shapes. Something cylindrical. Yep. Two things. Do you see? I think there's a sphere actually there in the middle. 
what is the experience of this like? Do you actually feel a physical corner when you see bent light round the corner of that cube? Oh, oh goodness. Interacting with chat is a bit tough. All right. Anyway, the point I want to make here is that I can present really kind of low level information and you can, if I dare open, open the chat up again. Yeah, there's a single base, there's a single table in many forms sitting on top. That's right. So there's just a, a tabletop and then lots of different shapes also covered in black velvet so the light doesn't scatter. And the light traces the outline of these 3D shapes. And you can appreciate something about what the shapes are just by watching how light bends around their surface and the relative motion as it traverses that facade, right? As it moves over the surface of the sphere, the light bends according to its curvature. And I would argue here that because you have some notion of what a sphere is and some notion of what a cube is, that is you have a relatively abstract model of these underlying shapes in your mind, a mental model, you can do some inference when you see light move over their surface in this way, even though I choose an example like this because you've probably never seen this example before, right? You've never seen a single line of laser light move over this table surface, even this, this kind of setup, but you can still do that inference pretty well. And you did in the chat. So if you'll, if you'll stay with me here, I'm suggesting that this is an example just pure perceptually of how we can bring kind of models of the world and shapes and forms that comprise it to bear on simple visual stimuli and how we can even do that by using articulated light to isolate aspects of those stimuli and to kind of elucidate our perception to us. Uh, so we do a lot of things like this in the MIT Museum Studio where I teach the vision art and neuroscience class, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, but that's where this this was filmed. Let's see if it'll let me advance, even though I opened the chat. All right. So another kind of setting in which we often hear and think about models of the world and this kind of inference is in intuitive physics. Uh, and I bring this up because some of my background is also in this type of work, investigating how the brain represents physical properties like mass that it uses to reason physically about the world, right? You would have to estimate the mass of this block that's falling and making a depression on this pillow before you would know the right amount of grip force you would need to use to, to reach in and pick it up without dropping it, right? And this is something we do incredibly automatically, and it's a skill set we develop regularly from a very early age. And I found that the brain represents properties like mass with an amount of abstraction and invariance to the type of physical scene in which mass is revealed that would be necessary if mass like this were to be used as an input to an abstract generalized engine for physical simulation or what we call a physics engine uh, in computer graphics and simulation, suggesting that there is kind of some first evidence that the brain does use these kind of generalized simulation engines to solve low level inference problems like inferring mass because we can make some hypothesis about the nature of the underlying representations it would need if it were to solve problems in this kind of way, rather than by simple pattern matching or in a pixel based way where we would assume that the representation of mass would be quite different from scene to scene because the low level visual data about the scene is different. But in fact, that's not what we find. We find representations of physical variables like mass and friction that generalize across any kind of physical scene that we test, um, where we hold a lot of other different parameters constant, right, like object color. And this suggests an account of physical reasoning in the brain that has been that has been studied pretty extensively computationally, right? And that we model via probabilistic simulations of a physics engine. Oh, I don't think that video is going to play for us, right? Um, but this is the kind of work when I was doing when that I was doing when I was writing down like explicit models of the world that could be inverted to explain something about underlying parameters we were using for vision. And in that in this case, those models were physical, right? But what about cases like, like art, where it's difficult, as I mentioned, to develop some kind of computational formalism, where we don't know the underlying model, for instance, how to create the Cezanne painting we saw in the beginning, a priori, right? How do we even start? What are the underlying dimensions we need to write down to either make sense of how we see things, 
or how they're created. So this whole area is kind of what we dive into in that vision and art and neuroscience course. So this is something you're interested in. It's of course an unsolved problem, um, but we spend the fall semester every year uh, kind of delving into it through both neuroscience literature, through art practice, through computation, and then through studio work. So kind of hands-on experimentation uh, with principles underlying vision that we then externalize and experience ourselves and try and visualize in artistic contexts. Uh, to give you a, a little bit of a taste of that class, we would look at these examples, say, by, by an artist named Minor White, and ask if we were trying to set up a typical kind of describe a model and then invert it to understand vision setting, you know, what is the veridical percept in either of these, right? If before we were considering mass of some object that the brain has to infer, and we can write down a physical law describing how mass plays into to action unfolding in a scene, a law describing dynamics, and then invert it to think about how the brain represents mass, what would the analog be here? What would we write down as the veridical percept? You can share some thoughts in the chat. That is also an exercise you can just do yourself, right? Maybe here you can start to get it a shadow of something outside the window. I see a bike, maybe a bike seat there, but that's kind of not the point. You're kind of not trying to infer what caused the specific physics of this, this image. You're, you're kind of getting at something different. And especially here, what if the artist isn't around for us to ask anymore? These are actual photographs, right? These are photographs of something, but the act of looking at it isn't about inferring the underlying cause of the image. It's about inferring something else, sort of aesthetic parameters that define visual experience or kind of render visual experience at a lot higher of a level. How do we begin to get traction on problems like this, either in seeing or in, or in generation? As I said, you know, in art, we also come up against a great difficulty in that, you know, there are infinitely many ways to render recognizable depictions of common objects, right? With all sorts of idiosyncrasies, illusory boundaries, difficult for models to detect, but we recognize a woman in these images with a dress almost instantaneously. And similarly, we come up against another under constrained inverse problem is in that there's infinitely many ways to render and depict kind of abstractions of commonly recognizable forms, which again are, are difficult for current day models, but they're pretty easy for us. I can recognize a figure and maybe have different associations with it in each of these different images. So we think a little bit about this um, in the course, like I mentioned, you can ask me a bit after this talk as well, if you're, if you're interested in it. Um, it's called Vision and Art and Neuroscience. All of our info is, is online. Most of the syllabus, um, past exhibition catalogs at vision.mit.edu. It's offered through, through BCS, and as I said, we, we investigate during half the class in the seminar portion of the class, kind of the underlying principles of vision. And we work through a series of modules um, that build up visual processes from early level, like V1 visual processing, all the way up to kind of more rich images. And we do this in parallel in a studio section during the other portion of the class where we're translating these principles of vision into the studio and building artistic contexts where we can kind of become aware of our own perceptual processing at work. So examples like the one I showed you at the beginning, right, with the, with the laser line moving over that garden of objects are examples of settings that can allow us to maybe perceive our own perception at work, right, or shed some light on what's going on when we look at, at normal scenes, right? There's all these unconscious inference processes happening, even when we look at corners in a room, but we're not aware of them. And so we ask here if we can create settings where we do become intensely aware of them. And that awareness becomes kind of the art experience, right? And so it's the art of perceiving one's own perceptual processes at work. Um, and then over the course of the class, everybody develops an individual artwork for exhibition, which is super lovely. Uh, and it's, it's an opportunity that we don't often have in other classes at MIT. So we've run this for five years now. Um, had five different exhibitions. In COVID, we had a virtual exhibition. Um, and then this year's just opened in December and is actually still up uh, in the MIT Museum studio, just off of Lobby 10, 10 150. If anybody is on campus and wants to go check it out, it's, most, it's open most days when, when staff are there. But this course is the parallel to 
your IAP class that thinks about things more in the language of computational neuroscience um, than deep learning. And in some aspects of the course, we'll present deep learning or deep generative models as contexts for probing representations that might be shared by human minds and machines. And we'll look at that a little bit later um, in this lecture, but think more traditional computational neuroscience, lectures, readings, visual art, and then a studio component where you experiment with some of the stuff hands on. So that's what we do in vision art and neuroscience. Uh, we start to, to probe at the richness of this art, neuro, and machine learning intersection. There are a lot of different things we can do there. And for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna highlight a number of different projects that approach that intersection in different ways and highlight kind of different ways that you could think about engaging this material and these questions, data sets and resources that we have available and kind of different ways of carving up the problem into bits. Uh, so we'll start by thinking about modeling kind of the structure underlying human creativity at scale without trying to pre-specify laws that you would write down for say a physics engine, right? Can we use deep generative models to kind of approximate or appreciate or grok the structure underlying large data sets of human cultural artifacts and then use those models to experiment with cultural history on kind of a timeline that allows rapid evolution in the present. Uh, so I'm speaking specifically about a project that I don't know if some of you have seen, I know Ali has seen uh, a collaboration that I led with the Met a couple of years ago. Um, again, it was fun that we were in person because we were able to, to actually go to the Met and see a lot of these objects. Uh, but back in 2017, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was the first or one of the very first to release an open access catalog of a few hundred thousand digital images of works in the Met collection um, and released them into the public domain which is wonderful for, for us as uh, computer scientists and programmers and people interested in ML and art because what a rich data set that is, right? What a rich data set all in one place. Don't get me started on the issues with museum APIs, but a lot of museums have followed suit in releasing their digital collections into the public domain. So they're free and open for experimentation. Um, they approached us at MIT and Open Learning uh, and a couple of programmers at Microsoft and asked if we might wanna do a series of projects with this digital collection. And so we did, and we asked whether we can build deep generative models associated with archives like this of created work that are embedded in their cultural context, which might, ask, which might allow us to ask like slightly more specific questions art historically than just, you know, what if you trained StyleGAN on all of WikiArt all at once, right? Not conditionally, so we're not appreciating any categorical differences between images, but if we just showed it all of WikiArt. Okay, here we want to ask something a little more fine-grained. Can we notice kind of differences in the development of feature languages between maybe time periods or geographical regions, right? And can we develop ways of collaborating with those models to iterate archives forward? So experimenting with chimeras between existing works and developing new works, right? That might sit somewhere between works that are already on a graph. So one of the challenges that we faced here initially was that the data set was pretty big, 400,000 images, but each individual category in that data set was not. Some might only have a couple hundred images. Um, there's a lot of sketches and drawings and kind of uncategorized work too that makes up that 400,000. So you're in a situation where in theory you have a rich labeled data set, but in practice, it might be quite difficult to train anything that looks photorealistic or gives a good sense of any individual category of work because the categories themselves are not that large. So at that point, this was pre like StyleGAN2. We started working on this in 2017, 2018. Um, and I asked whether we could, instead of training a single model on say a subset of this Met collection, like this category of vases called yours, whether we could find corresponding like, subspaces of what we're now referring to as foundation models like BigGAN ImageNet, they kind of approximate our data set, right? So if we think about foundation models as a shared resource that ideally everybody would have access to and there were ways to think about contributing to, then maybe these smaller problems become or can become a way of defining subspaces of those big models that we can interact with, right? Rather than having to retrain a model on our, on our data set. 
So we used GAN inversion here. And instead of training a new model on just this category of viewers, we asked whether we could embed each image that already existed into, in the Met collection into the feature space of Big GAN ImageNet, which happens to have a category for vases. So we selected categories that were shared between ImageNet and the Met Collection. There are a handful, about a dozen. Um, and we maximized for each of those images the similarity between the Met image and the Big GAN image using a two-part loss, right? So we wanted them to be similar both at the pixel level and at the semantic level. And we did that by looking at two different layers of a pre-trained ResNet um, as the embedding network. So once we've embedded these models, uh, these images into BigGAN, we can then visualize the individual embeddings, but we can also do something a little bit more interesting than just look at approximations of these images, which might not be very good. We can think about the underlying feature language that might've been learned, and then look at interpolations between the existing images in the Met collection. I hear, Murmurs in the background, if anybody has a question, hit the chat. You're super welcome to speak up. Um, so next we look at interpolations between these existing images on the graph, and we can create kind of hypothetical or dreamlike images that exist between the spaces of existing works in the collection. And these are pretty interesting and beautiful, and they allow us, as I was mentioning, to ask questions about what collaborations between geographical regions might have looked like, right? Because we do have categorical information about where each image in the Met collection came from. It allows us to suggest new objects and the spaces between them. So it allows us to interpolate. And then the other beauty of these kinds of executable models of culture is that it allows us to iterate on existing collections really rapidly um, and evolve them forward. And so we can kind of start to imagine archives of the future that would have embedded within them world models corresponding to the data set that exists at one point in the archive, right? So the archives could kind of evolve themselves forward and suggest future versions of their collections based on what's already been created. And that this is, again, this was back in 2019, which is a long time ago in computer vision terms. Um, but even just with, with inversion into to big GAN image, I was really impressed at the quality of the the images and the, the hypothetical objects that we could get. For example, here are a bunch of different generated teapots from the Met latent space in the teapot category, which again happened to be shared between ImageNet at that point um, and the Met collection. And as I said, we did have the, the opportunity to exhibit this in the Met, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, we projected a visualization of this latent space superimposed on a map of the Met collection and allowed people, visitors to the, to the Great Hall to kind of step in to this latent space as projected onto the ground and explore the traversal of the spaces between works um, in a projection behind them on the wall. We also made a web app version of all of this that exists, even though we, we can't visit the Met today. Um, it's online at gen.studio if you want to go have a look after this. And then all of the, the code base is linked. The GitHub is linked at the bottom um, if you want to check out any of that more specifically. But again, it places us kind of a different framing of latent space traversal than we're used to that I was interested in this project was to place us on, and now we've gotten a lot further along in the video, um, but you can go look at the, at the website, places us on a map between the objects when we're doing the interpolations, right? So we select an object to start, now we land in the latent space of Big GAN close to that object. And then we can move ourselves around on the map between objects and their embeddings in that latent space, right? And as we're moving physically in 2D space here, online, we can visualize what exists at that point in latent space. And then we can find its nearest neighbor visually uh, in the Met collection and find what object in the existing collection is most similar to the hypothetical work that we discovered in the interstices between two existing works. Um, so give that a look. And this project lives on today um, in a couple of different forms. I'm still working with the artist, Matthew Ritchie, who was a collaborator um, with us on the Met project um, on a couple of different tendrils of, of this work where we're asking, all right, so we can model projections of existing images in the Met, in the Met collection by finding their embeddings in some kind of large foundation model. But now 
in 2021, we have things like StyleGAN ADA that can, can train on smaller data sets and do reasonably well in approximating data sets that would correspond to a single category in the MET collection. So we've done that. Um, we've trained these models on sketches, um, Babylonian cuneiform tablets, Japanese watercolors, um, and some 18th century European landscapes, among other things, and have individual models corresponding to each of these genres within the MET collection. Uh, and then we've been working with uh, a friend in New York who has a robotic oil painter and can actually create layered paintings of really short walks in latent space along different dimensions in this model. So think about physically visualizing uh, some of the steerability work you've looked at in this course, right? Could we make time paintings of really short walks in latent space by superimposing robotic paintings of um, the visualized image kind of at different points along that walk. So that's that's being exhibited right now at UNT uh, in their contemporary art gallery. I see I've got a question in the chat. Let me... Oh, it's just a compliment. I will take it at any point. <laughs> yeah, I think. Can so, you please read it? Yes. Uh, someone mentioned that this is a, a creative reason, one of the most creative reasons they've seen to do latent space interpolations of GANs. Yeah, I think that I had a slide a moment ago, if you want to rewind in the recording of this, suggesting that kind of part of the advent of using GANs to model kind of large databases of creative work is that they allow us to do a couple of things, right? That interpolation and that iteration. And in cases where you can't write down a feature language underlying a set of works because you don't know a priori what it is, you can imprint that, or you can learn something of that in a deep generative model, right? And then you can collaborate with that and hypothesize what might lie on a graph of human creation. If we presume that any creation, artistic creation at some point in historic time is, if you think about it as the manifestation of a point, on kind of a sea of cultural influences and multi-generational practice, iterative practice that's been shared between peoples and generations. And the creation of a single work is the enactment of that process at some point in space. It's natural to think of that in some sense as a model that we can capture in a latent space where we're manifesting some part of structured space at some moment. But this allows us to iterate on that, which I argue is similar to some historic processes of iteration and collaboration across groups of people really quickly, right? Um, so I've been trying to take this a little further now and ask, all right, we can make paintings of short walks in latent space. We can hypothesize objects that might have existed, but we don't think they ever did. But we still don't know much about these models, even if we train StyleGAN2 on a set of 2,000 paintings in the Met collection. Uh, you've probably seen some of the interpretability work adjacent to what Ali has shared or David Bao's work. So that style of thinking, we don't know anything about this Japanese watercolor model. Like what do its individual neurons represent? Is there a neuron for trees? Well, what is a tree here? It's some brushstrokes we recognize as a tree, but it's not something that big GAN trained on ImageNet would necessarily recognize as a tree. Maybe more simply, kind of in the, in the steerability context, what do dimensions in the latent space of a model like this correspond to, right? Sure, we can find things like zoom and 3D rotation because we can name those transformations and then find directions that maximally correspond to them using that kind of steerability technique. There are all sorts of other directions like the ones we're visualizing here that certainly have some affective meaning to the viewer um, that we don't know what they are in the model's terms or in the viewer's terms. So at this point in this project, we're thinking about starting to name and understand dimensions underlying generative models trained on bodies of artistic work uh, from museum digital collections, not only limited to the Met, um, but around the world. Uh, and our, our motivation here is to kind of create these alternate and imaginary histories of art built from unique latent walks that we can visualize in real time with this painting or computationally, uh, and then maybe understand something about aspects of picture language that might be shared across you know, vastly different genres. So Babylonian cuneiform tablets transformed from numeric to symbolic and image-based at a very particular point in history. And can we find a dimension 
in style GAN trained on a very different genre of art that corresponds to a similar kind of transformation. And as such, can we build up kind of a picture language that would correspond to diverse forms of art making, right? That you might not see in any of these different categories of, of digital images on our archive, but we might start to appreciate once we can investigate them by training deep generative models on them. Let's get back to, great. Okay, so when we're thinking about this intersection, we've seen one example of modeling the structure underlying creativity at scale. Um, and I've done other projects and you can find many examples online, uh, both of my work and other people's of trying to do this, not for creativity at scale, but for individual instances of individual artists um, and modeling either the style or the processes of individual art making techniques. Um, so all of these are kind of flavors of starting to imprint or grok or understand the structure underlying creativity. Uh, but not symbolically, right? So we don't we don't know how to interpret these models, even though we can visualize them and create really interesting hypothetical objects that might be indistinguishable either from existing work or from one artist's particular style. We can also think about these models as a tool themselves for collaboration, both in their creation and iteration um, with others who contribute to their models uh, and with the models themselves, which as I described, represent kind of executable versions of collective cultural structure. If we permit, our, permit ourselves to think about them that way um, or facets of kind of a global creative identity. And as I mentioned, now we're at a point um, with tools and computer vision where we can start to ask, what rep representations actually underlie these models trained on artworks that are themselves executable versions of some collective cultural structure, right? Well, what is the structure? What's going on under the hood? Do they correspond to dimensions that we find meaningful um, when we look at visual scenes? And so in the next part of the talk, I'll share a couple maybe more technical projects um, that explore specific ways that humans can interact with generative models in order to maybe learn something about human vision as well, right? So can we build shared vocabularies that help us interpret dimensions underlying these models um, by designing experiments that allow us to visualize and interact with images uh, and latent walks like you've been seeing. I'll pause here because I need a sip of water and I'll keep an eye on the chat in case anyone has any questions before we go on. All right, looks like we are question free so far. Five more seconds. I guess I have a question. Yeah. So this might be talked about later, but I was wondering a little bit about like in your research and kind of in this field, how much of like human interaction is like a big part of it and kind of like the human coming in and saying uh, how they think about something and see where that agrees with the computer or like kind of like where that role is played? Wonderful question. So these, ki these kinds of high level questions that get at some experiential component or design component of the work are I think really useful to so ask more of them. Um, I'll tell you for, for different projects what that looks like. And in the next section of work, it's gonna be really obvious because there's human annotations. But for this project, so the human would come in here, you know, we train models on data sets of art selected from the Met collection. And these are small and these are subsets. Uh, and they were gathered by Matthew Ritchie and myself going through different genres in the digital collection of the Met online um, and like hand selecting images from those different genres, right? Representative images of different categories of work or maybe in a less fine grained way all images under some designation. So Japanese watercolors between the 17th and 19th centuries. So we made that selection um, and tried training these models on a bunch of different such selections and decided which ended up, you know, with so few examples, providing at least a representative sample of the kind of work that we know we saw there, right? Um, and then here, the selection of like walks through latent space. So think of those in the same way you've been thinking about the steerability walks. Um, they were very arbitrary. So that was a completely human selected. Uh, so it's a kind of a different approach to interpretability where it's steered by the human eye, right? We're not doing it automatically and we're not doing symbol it symbolically. We don't know what these correspond to. Um, 
but that's trying some arbitrary walk through latent space, trying many of them. And then the human then selecting what to them felt like an artistic expression. This is an art exhibit. And then in the next step, we'll ask, how can we do that in a more systematic way and start to build a language corresponding to what those different walks could be, a language that's shared by humans. And that takes, at least right now, um, a lot of human, a lot of human interaction. You could think about ways to automate that. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but with any kind of human interaction, it's nice to preserve the opportunity for direct engagement with models rather than intermediation by a captioner or something like that, because then you could imagine using your technique on different subsets of humans, right? On different kinds of experiences. So you might imagine getting an art historian to label and select different walks through latent space here, corresponding to very nuanced changes in the development of Babylonian, like cuneiform tablets, right? That a captioner couldn't recognize, I couldn't recognize. So you might wanna be able to pull different kinds of humans into the loop at different times um, to engage in ways that kind of use their knowledge to create a unique synthesis with the generative model. Um, so that's what engagement looked like here. And then with this next project, it'll be super, it'll be super clear. Um, and I'll make sure to speak specifically to that. So thank you. Yeah, cool. Um, so next, this uh, is probably a summary of what you've seen so far in your IAP course. So there's a lot of different work on discovery of interpretable directions in the latent space of different generative models, right? And we can steer images along those dimensions to create interpretable transformations that allow us to interact creatively with deep generative models, right? Here we are, um, deep learning for creativity. But a lot of these examples presume what concepts we're searching for in the latent space. And in fact, they do that really explicitly, right? We will predefine a zoom transformation and then maximize the similarity between some transformation in the latent space and a zoom transformation as applied to some image. Maybe you've experimented with code for doing that. But that presumes we know we're looking for zoom in the first place. What if we find ourselves looking out into more you know, uncharted waters, so to speak? Here we ask how we can learn kind of a vocabulary of visual concepts, maybe one that you would apply to those style GANs we just saw, train on the MET images, right? We don't, maybe we could look for Zoom, but maybe there's all sorts of more interesting transformations we could do to those images, but we don't know what they are yet. How can we learn a vocabulary of visual concepts rather than predefining them or labeling them after the fact? So there are a variety now of unsupervised methods for distilling these kinds of transformations in latent space that find principal components of feature space of different layers of the model's activation. Maybe you've played around with methods like GAN space that search for and rank order the largest principal components of the feature space, which do provide us with interpretable transformations, but they're labeled after the fact, so we don't know if they're meaningful to humans kind of in their genesis, um, but we can, we can describe them, right, by providing labels to them, another point where the human kind of comes in the loop. Um, but we want to see if we can build in human vision to the discovery process, right? So to supervise it, but to not pre-commit to what kinds of concepts we're searching for. Um, so in this project, we're trying to build or define a method for building a visual concept vocabulary for an arbitrary GAN latent space. Uh, so to put it more specifically, we want to learn embeddings D, maybe you've called this W, we want to learn some kind of walk in the latent space Z of a GAN, we'll focus on big GAN here, um, of transformations that are salient to us in visual space. And we can't define an objective and optimize our D, our walk, to produce a transform in X in the image because we want to learn the vocabulary concepts rather than pre-commit to them. And we would have to pre-commit to what that objective is, right, in order to optimize D. So we're going to take a different approach and instead sample the space of salient or possible transformations um, for some given point in space, for some given Z, and then use those sample directions as a screen, so to speak, onto which we can project human perceptual judgments. So that's a little bit of a gratuitous metaphor, but maybe a useful way of thinking about it. Um, and then we'll, we'll disentangle the concepts that are projected onto that screen into a vocabulary of open-ended compositional visual concepts. Um, and what we're interested in here is the overlap between what's represented inside a model, so some deep features in a model's representation, and concepts meaningful to humans in visual scene understanding. And we're asking how we might start to 
define, although not completely, but start to define a shared vocabulary between the two or for a given model, determine what lies in that set overlap. Uh, and I don't have to dwell too long on a lot of the specifics here. It's all online at that URL if you want to read the paper. Um, but as I mentioned, the first thing we're going to do is generate a set of sample images um, that produce minimal meaningful transformations in images. Uh, and then humans come in the loop again. We're going to ask them to label them. But here we're forming kind of the basis for the data set that we'll build our vocabulary off of. And we want to keep in mind that we want a vocabulary in the end that is both diverse so corresponding to a lot of different changes that you can produce in an image and specific where a single transformation corresponds quite reliably to one visual change across viewers. And so we do that by defining uh, mutually orthogonal, what we call layer selective directions. And these minimize change in the feature representation at some layer of big gan, at some layer we'll call it layer L. And this allows us to capture relatively focused changes um, because we hold constant how much the representation can change at some layer. And we do that for different layers to capture changes at different levels of abstraction. So as you can see, layers closer to the image output control more fine-grained aspects of the image, like the color of the walls and the bedspread. And as we get closer back to the latent space, we're allowed to make kind of more higher level changes in things like the zoom and perspective of the scene um, and its composition, so what objects are present. So here we have a base set of minimal meaningful transformations that capture changes in images at different levels of abstraction. We're gonna ask people to label them because we don't know what's going on visually in these scenes, right? Um, so we started at a pretty small scale with just four categories in the places data set um, and looked at big GAN trained on ImageNet and places. We'll just talk about places here and visualized uh, a handful, a few thousand of these directions per category. So in each of four categories, looked at cottages, medinas, so uh, street marketplaces, kitchens and lakes, a mix of indoor and outdoor scenes. And then asked people to just simply describe the overall transition that they saw when these directions were applied to different randomly sampled starting points in the latent space, right? So one direction might take this cottage to this snowy cottage and change something about the sky and change the snow. So these, these changes are still complex. We can recognize that it's the same scene and we can describe in simple language what's going on, uh, but they're, they're not disentangled yet, right? One direction might correspond to a number of different visual changes. Um, so we did a little pre-processing to capture, you know, what kinds of concepts are associated with each transformation. And then we decomposed those annotated directions into a visual concept vocabulary consisting of single directions labeled with single words. And we formulated that as a linear regression and then solved for the embeddings of individual concepts in the latent space of our big GAN. And then we can basically read those off um, of our matrix E and then transform the images by manipulating them some amount along those visual concept directions. Happy to talk more details about that if anybody's specifically interested, or you can check out the paper itself. Um, we found over 2000 concepts this way, corresponding to lots of different types of visual changes. So we can reproduce transformations like zoom and rotation, things like color, um, but we also get kind of a unique set of concepts corresponding to aspects of scenes like their mood. For instance, there's a direction in latent space of big GAN that makes outdoor marketplace is more festive. And here we see applying that direction to an example marketplace and it rolls out a red carpet, hangs some flags and brings a lot of people um, into that market. We can visualize kind of a, a sampling of these directions each applied to two different images uh, in different categories. So some directions make cottages more manicured, add arches to marketplaces add shadows or make the whole scene blue. And we see directions like this that generalize across all of the categories of Big GAN that we looked at. You can check out the late category. We can add sunsets, but also do kind of scene specific things like add reflections to water or make a lake scene foggier, make a kitchen more inviting or more modern. And again, we didn't have to pre-specify what exactly modernity would entail when applied to a kitchen. We learned that through sampling what humans associate with a transformation that 
was sampled randomly, right? Uh, and then humans labeled that as modern, and then we disentangled the specific direction in latent space corresponding to that single concept word. And once it's isolated, we can apply a modern transformation and know that it corresponds to what viewers found uh, to represent modernity in a kitchen. Well, I said we know that it corresponds to what viewers see as more modern, um, but we don't know that for sure, right? We still need to ask questions like, how generalizable are these directions? Um, do they compose, right? Can we add a festive direction to eerie and get something that's both scary and festive, right? Or could we make a kitchen both more modern and inviting? Uh, so we asked those questions in a series of behavioral experiments that I left for you to check out in the paper itself. So we, we won't, in the interest of time, go through those here. Um, but we do find that these directions are composable and they're generalizable across categories. Um, so there are some cases where we can even add a concept that was learned in a single category to a different category, for instance, making a cottage more festive, right, or adding snow to a marketplace, even though that's not traditionally seen there. Uh, we ran a set of behavioral experiments evaluating the extent to which this is successful uh, and isolating a couple of few specific cases where it fails. Okay, so this, this wraps up this method. Um, it's at a point now where we're trying this with some of the, the art models that I discussed previously, right? So this was still just applied to big GAN trained on real world images, trained on ImageNet. Uh, but you can imagine using a similar, similar method to find dimensions of visual interest that are also meaningful to humans um, in the latent space of a model trained on our images. And so decompose feature languages underlying different genres of art into something describable so that we can make concerted manipulations to images sampled either from foundation models that correspond to approximations of real world images um, or to models trained on, on archives of art images themselves. Uh, I'll pause here for any questions about this. Um, there's associated code also available on that project page I linked. I have a quick question. Please. Um, was there a reason you chose uh, BitGAN over starting with like StyleGAN for this type of work? Uh, no, um, just a couple of different code bases that already existed um, and people that had worked on BitGAN for like GAN dissection. We had an easy way to dissect BitGAN and hypothesize what kind of things might be there. Uh, so a lot of the GAN dissection work started with BitGAN and so I was picking up where that left off and asking if we could find like style vectors that corresponded to scene level transformations instead of individual neurons. Um, but I have extended this to style GAN outside of the paper. It's just not. Got it. Spots here. Yeah, the method's pretty, I mean, there are a couple of different cha small changes you have to make, um, but the method is pretty model agnostic, just like defining a set of directions that samples the latent space in kind of minimal ways. And the, the method I described here is definitely not the only one you could use for that, right? Um, you could sample them by just finding the principal components of the feature space, or you could sample them randomly, right? You could just find two points in latent space, interpolate, and then get people to label what's going on there. Um, we tried a lot of these different methods uh, and found that if you, if you make random interpolations between two randomly sampled points, then there's just so much going on in the scene um, that there's not a lot of inter-observer agreement in how people annotate what they see. There's just too much going on, so we need to isolate specific changes. That's why we developed that layer selective method for isolating minimal changes. Um, but what if we used kind of the, the principal component method, right, or used something like GAN space? Um, there we found that the principal components of the model's feature space aren't necessarily the most interesting to humans. So we might get a ton of different types of rotating the scene, but not a lot of different changes in mood or changes in color up there in high ranked principal components. Um, so that's where that method came from, but it's agnostic to the set of directions and pretty model agnostic. Uh, the annotation is another place where humans intervene here to, to tie in that last question. Um, but you can imagine training a captioner on a labeled data set like this, right? A little larger than the one we collected. So we're thinking about doing something like that, uh, but preserving the human annotation does allow annotation, you know, in the art context by experts, as I mentioned. 
So you might want to be able to do this at scale for a brand new model and just have automatic annotations. You use something like CLIP, right, for the kinds of transformations you would see inside, um, but preserve the opportunity for experts to, to annotate kind of specialized, smaller trained models. And there are results too from big NAND train on a couple of different data sets if you're interested. All right. um, I have a question regarding yeah. like um, the choice of uh, N in terms of uh, annotations. Mm. Um, so uh, how did you arrive at this number and how are you, I mean, how do you know like what number is kind of sufficient? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so I assume you mean the total number of images we needed to annotate and not the total number of annotations per image. Which end do you mean? I can talk. Oh, I see. Before. I mean, either. Uh. Yeah, well, okay. So at both levels, uh, for the directions themselves, we needed to collect at least two annotations to be able to measure intersubject agreement, right? Uh, we wanna see if some direction is consistently producing meaningful similar annotations across annotators, we need at least two people to annotate them. Um, so for all the directions we evaluated, we had two annotators label them and measured the inter-annotator agreement using a couple of different metrics, blue and birth scores. Um, but for a subset of those, we had 10 annotators annotate them and just had a look at inter-annotator agreement across a slightly larger group uh, for expense reasons, we didn't do that for, for all the directions because it really wasn't necessary. Things didn't change that much. And even in that subset, when we went from two to 10 per, uh, per direction. And then for the number of directions that we chose to visualize, it was not a very principled decision, I'm afraid. Um, we chose, I think, 64 Z uh, per category and then a bunch of different minimal meaningful directions for them corresponding to, I think the same number of principal components that we looked at in the GAN space paper. So maybe the top 20 in each category. So it was a bit ad hoc, that decision. Um, the, the things that's gonna change, we can distill vocabularies using this method for like any size of annotation library, right? Uh, which is one of, the, one of the beauties and one of the things that gives itself to, to some of these more ad hoc decisions. Um, we're doing it analytically, right? If we go back to this, we're actually like reading off, we're solving for the embedding matrix um, of word embeddings in latent space of concept embeddings. So we could do this with like just a couple of directions. <laughs> um, if you only had one annotation per concept, it only appeared once, then you're just going to get that direction. Um, so as you increase the vocabulary, as you increase the, the sample size, you're, you're probably going to get a richer vocabulary, but it's still possible to do on a vocabulary of this size. Um, so we're deciding now whether it makes sense to scale this up and collect like a number of annotations where it would be possible, like I said, to, to train a captioner on them to be able to automatically label these directions rather than have humans do it. So part of it is constrained by tractability of experiments on Mechanical Turk, right? How many reliable annotations you can get in some period of time. Uh, awesome, uh, thank you. Yeah. These are really useful questions. These are great. Um, kind of along those lines, more yeah. of a random question. For the printer, like the single words for the labels, Yep. Was it kind of agreed upon earlier, like kind of what words you'd use? Because like for festive, maybe someone would say lively or for inviting, you'd say welcoming. Is there like kind of a similarity score for those words or how, really how does that question. work? Really good question. Um, no. So this is, it's only pre-processed with like a little bit of limitizing. So we collapse different endings people might be using or different verb conjugations onto single verbs. Uh, but festive would have a different direction from lively. Uh, kind of a next step in post-processing that we've talked about but haven't yet done um, is to just collapse across like word nets and sets, right? So you could use something like that to find synonyms of festive and then approximate one direction for lively and then be able to break it down into something maybe more fine-grained. Um, but there were no kind of heuristics or standards for the annotators, except, you know, they did, a, they did a practice run and looked at a couple of different examples and were asked to describe an overall transformation that captured changes at lots of different 
kind of levels of abstraction, we can look at the specific, what did we tell them? It's on here. Yeah. How would you describe the overall transition? Changes in mood, changes in objects or features of the scene. Don't mention you're describing images, so standard kind of Turk boilerplate, just address the content of what you see. And then they could look at some samples, and then after they did a practice run, they did the annotations. Um, so any inter-annotator agreement is just based on their word choice, which in some sense is a raw window into perception, but in some sense that's bullshit, and there's going to be a lot of noise there. Uh, and we did see that reflected when we used I don't have this on these slides, um, but when we use blue scores to, to measure inter-annotator agreement, so when we use these layer selective directions to generate these kinds of transformations, if we get 10 people to annotate each transformation, people might use, somebody might say eerie, somebody might say spooky, right? Somebody might say scary to describe the sky. Uh, that comes up as like quite different when you look at some methods of evaluating inter-annotator agreement. So we used birth scores as well that evaluate like semantic similarity um, instead of just literal correspondence words uh, and found that annotations of these kinds of directions performed a lot higher when we looked at semantic similarity of annotations as opposed to just, um, just word-based. So there's definitely reason to start trying to collapse like that when we look at the vocabulary too, but we haven't yet. And in some sense, it's it's kind of beautiful because you can see all of the different words that people used to describe changes, um, but you'd get a lot more power, right? If you could combine annotations for festive and lively and vibrant under one umbrella. Bit of a trade. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Any other high or low level questions? I think I just have a, maybe one or two more things, but not much. So ask away if you do. I think uh, more more of a higher level question. Yeah. I remember uh, Ali in the first uh, lecture, um, right? You um, uh, drew you had this visualization of like two points, um, the latent space, and you know a loss function that would steer like from one uh, or trajectory one to the other, but it was like um, something more like a curve or something nonlinear. Um, right, and you you mentioned with GAN inversion, if you just interpolate like <laughs> uh, draw a straight line between two points, yep. you have like all sorts of things happening. Uh, I was wondering um, if there's like a, I guess almost like a like a un I guess unsupervised, um, not a random walk, but a, a walk that would I guess uh, lead to less per per perturbations. I guess in um, in terms of like features, I mean, uh, th th does that make sense? Uh, yeah, we. I really wanted to do that for this project. Um, maybe hmm. Ali can speak a little bit more about about his work there. Maybe after we stop this recording. But um, linearization of this is a huge over oversimplification, um, and that would be one of exactly what you described is one of the things I'm most keen to try is taking nonlinear walks. Uh, mm -hmm. through any of these subspaces. Um, so very on point question, haven't done it. You should try and do it. Um, <laughs> but describing like this, the semantic structure of latent space, the semantic topology, if you'll permit me that, uh, is a really interesting question um, because even the visual meaning corresponding to some of these adjectives, some of these words is not regularized or normalized in the latent space itself. So if I take five steps in the festive direction, it might take me five steps to get anything that will start to register to me as festive. Um, but the walk size for a correspondingly large visual change, so to speak, in a different direction could be very different. Um, so some transformations like making an image black and white, this is anecdotal, but you only have to go like one step in that direction. And then we'll visualize the change almost immediately. Uh, so we're not kind of we're not walking around in like perceptually normalized space, so to speak. Um, and there hasn't been, to my knowledge, a lot of work that's addressed that. Everything's been a little bit ad hoc. Um, so thinking about semantic topology, subspaces, nonlinear versus linear paths, and how we can think about kind of the concept mesh underlying latent space for different generative models is extremely interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a really cool area to do some work in. Cool, thank you. Yeah, let's ask Ali about that figure once we pull off here. Um, I've got one more thing to show you, a quick example to hopefully spark 
more discussion, unless anybody has anything specific about this project. We can always come back. All right. All right. Oh, geez. Well, last thing I'm going to show you uh, is still a beta, and uh, it's very it's very early in its even thought development, but it captures something. Um, that I think is deeply interesting uh, and I think might be interesting to you all. Um, so the former method that I showed you for building shared vocabulary between humans and models uh, relies heavily on language, right? And so we get some direction and we're able to share that between people and even to repeatedly use it to steer through model space um, because we've given it a label, right? We've used language. And you might even argue that, you know, that's constraining the space of what people can recognize in those initial sample directions, because there might be some je ne sais quoi aspects of, of images that we don't really have words for, um, but are still like really recognizable, or perhaps the verbal, you know, the, the words you would use to describe something are like quite complex and you wouldn't type that into an annotation like on Mechanical Turk. Maybe you'd want to describe the sky as like the sky you saw at your grandmother's house the day she passed away or some flowers as effervescent like latte foam or a sparkling drink, but you're not going to type that into Mechanical Turk and there's not a single word concept to capture it. So that's going to get lost in the method I described and lost in a lot of kind of standard either annotation based or a kind of hard-coded direction search. So I wanted to experiment with a way to capture and learn um, directions without language. And this is like deeply inspired by the steerability work um, of all these. So you'll see a method here that is, is similar to that in some sense, um, but we're allowing the human to define the transformation that they want, rather than predefining, say, a zoom or rotation transform using an algorithm, we're allowing humans to come into the loop and define that transformation purely visually by interacting with very, very small batches of images sampled from latent space or feature space at some layer and sort them into classes corresponding to some visual feature, its presence or its absence. Um, and this provides a pipeline where users can steer, just like in the steerability work, along dimensions that they discover, however, that they define, and they define them purely visually. So labeling would happen just as a matter of convenience, but they're discovered um, through vision. So the way to do this is really simple. Um, take some latent space. Again, a lot of these examples are, are using big GAN. You could also use style GAN. Um, take some latent space and sample images from it, right? If you're using a conditional model, so we pick some category here, we're looking at lakes inside Big GAN image or Big GAN places. Um, sample some images for a user, and then that user who's determining a visual dimension of interest kind of looks over that image space and sees if anything stands out to them um, across that, that set of images. So maybe here I noticed images that seemed kind of verdant and fertile uh, and maybe more, more spring-like, but not totally seasonal. You see where I'm going. It's kind of hard to describe. And these were a little drearier or more wintry, but there's not snow, so it's not really winter. They're just kind of less fertile and vivid. So that's the distinction I want to make there. Um, and the method is very simple, just like the steerability work. Um, and a, a, another example of work from Bole, we define uh, a transformation just by learning a hyperplane, so training this SVM and learning a hyperplane that separates those two classes of images, either in the latent space or in the feature space of some layer, layers activations. And then we can steer some starting image in a direction that's normal to that hyperplane and steer it across those classes, right? So I could take an image that starts in the kind of drearier domain um, or duskier domain and transform it normally to that hyperplane and take it into the category of things that I thought was more verdant, right? Or more fertile. But I could specify that separating hyperplane just by sorting a shockingly few number of images. Um, so we've done a couple of more like fine grained tests here, but just for proof of concept, you can 
discern these directions with some degree of reliability with just like five to six examples of images in each category, making it really simple to interact with something like this, just by dragging and sorting a few images um, that are sampled from the latent space. Okay, so there's a tiny example of a demo app we have for this, um, and we're switching where it's hosted. So it's not online at this very moment, but it will be next week. Uh, but it's called the Latent Compass. It was at NeurIPS Creativity, I think, last year, the year before. Um, you'll see the, the home interface in a second. But what we do is just what I said, pick some category of Big GAN. Here it's Big GAN Places. Um, on the bottom, you see images sampled from that category, and the user drags them to the right and left of the screen, corresponding to two different kind of categories of concepts they want to capture. Uh, and then once the compass calibrates, and we'll see that in a second, and you can drag any new image and then transform it along that dimension. So here, right, we pick the closet category. I've got full closets on the right, empty closets on the left, and the dimension I want to capture here is something like fullness. So I'm going to see if I can I can learn a direction corresponding to the visual difference between these two categories, drag any new closet onto that center line and transform it along that direction, filling and emptying the closets. And what if we tried a different category? What if I wanted to turn a Medina into a full closet, right? What is the type of fullness that's relevant to a Medina? Oh, well, it's adding people instead of adding clothes, suggesting that what's been learned there, that direction in latent space, is abstract and generalizable enough to capture some visually recognizable dimension of, of fullness that's meaningful to us in different scenes, right? And the model is able to, to generalize it in a way that's not totally dependent on the types of objects it saw in one scene. So it knows in a sense that clothes make a closet full, but to make a market full, we're not adding clothes, we're adding people. And so the fullness direction is something that adds more of whoever would make that scene full um, to any scene that we're selecting in the model, right? And trained on so few examples, of course, this, this is really quite imperfect, but it's a good proof of concept of a way that users can interact super flexibly and really visually with dimensions of interest um, and use that to kind of explore and surf the latent space of a model um, by producing replicable, repeatable directions that others can explore without having to use language. It's kind of a different way of carving up the puzzle of how to explore and assign meaning to directions that we that we find in latent space. Okay, that's at latentcompass.com. But we'll be back up next week, I think. Bad timing. Okay, so to, ref to return to our frame here, uh, we've been digging a bit into this intersection between art, neuroscience, and machine learning, ways to explore models that have been trained on human creation, right, at different scales to create a new to iterate and interpolate upon archives, and then also to start to understand what these models are representing. And if our ways of interpreting dimensions inside models can also teach us something about human perception um, or allow us to start to build models of aspects of human vision uh, that are otherwise pretty intractable because it's difficult to formalize what dimensions underlie them where I could write down what dimensions underlie physical scene understanding because I know Newton's laws. I couldn't write down what dimensions underlie aesthetic perception of North African marketplaces or Babylonian tablets because I don't know what a large swath of people would find perceptually interesting in a bunch of marketplaces. I know from cognitive science research, certain heuristics to look for, but that wouldn't give us a full set of what a diversity of humans might appreciate when looking at some scene, especially things like its mood. Um, so we can turn here to these kinds of large unstructured generative models that learn entirely from data, entirely from images, and turn to them as like a, a fertile ground, so to speak, for starting to probe and represent human perceptual experiences inside their latent space. And think of latent space that way, right? As a screen, as I said before, onto which we can project human experience. And then once we have those projections, we can rerun them and interact with them and collaborate with them to create outputs of deep generative models that are particularly exquisite and that represent some kind of collaboration between us and models of our, our creation that are operating in parallel. Um, so that's where I will leave us. Uh, my email's here. I'm very discoverable online. Uh, 
but you're welcome to write me questions anytime. Um, and I will wrap here and we can have a more casual discussion unless anybody has any last questions for this part. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was really interesting and uh, inspiring with all the uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, slides and every moment of that was really full of thoughts. I think that you uh, open uh, a window to uh, semantically and qualitatively looking at uh, these latent spaces and sort of uh, our imagination and uh, where we dream and where these models that we create dream. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to stop recording and then see if there are more questions. <laughs>